Um, welcome to our artist talk um, featuring Lacey um, Prososki's uh, work, uh, and she'll be talking to us about her work tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce Lacey, and then she's going to um, take over uh, and give you her presentation. Um, Lacey Prososki uh, will complete her BFA in painting and minor in psychology at Oregon State University this summer. Uh, her bodies of work include clouded vision, chroma contagion, and talking to the mirror. Her paintings and fused glass sculptures have been exhibited in gallery shows and exhibitions across the state of Oregon, including the State of the Coast Conference in Lincoln City in 2019 and Eyes on Fire at the Truck and Broad Gallery in 2020. She's curated exhibitions, including uh, uh, Plan B at the Lynn Benton Community College. She works as a painting and fused glass instructor at Oregon State University Craft Center and teaches virtual painting uh, classes for the nonprofit Painting with Parkinson's, and she is co-founder of Art for Bale, an ongoing fundraiser for the Bale Project. After graduation, Lacey plans on furthering her studies in art therapy, um, and now I will hand things over to Lacey, and um, you can hear about her work. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be turning my video off while I'm screen sharing, just so that I'm less likely to freeze up, um, but I will turn it back on doing questions. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here virtually. My name is Lacey Prasovsky. My pronouns are she, her. I grew up in Lawrence, Kansas, and moved to Oregon three and a half years ago to study here at OSU. I'm a BFA major with a focus in painting and secondary focus in printmaking with a minor in psychology. And I'm planning to further my education in art therapy. Um, I'm going to be talking about my thesis show, Pseudo Solitude, and my artistic practice in general this evening. So to start off, some themes and ideas naturally hold a thread throughout my artwork over the years. These are some of the artwork I created in high school. And the piece on the bottom left is about the romanticization of afterlife as a way to cope with my own mortality. I think a lot about the romanticizing and dissociation that occur as coping mechanisms in general with relationships, places, et cetera. Some subjects that interest me most include human relationships and connection, figures in the body, psychology, memory, and emotion. Tied Up was a project for a class in New Genre, a painting class that utilized a multimedia approach focusing on concepts. The same tie I painted was used in a video of friends attempting to tie a tie. This video acts as commentary on professionalism, the preparation, frustration, and nervousness behind it, and how most of us don't really know what we are doing. The volunteers had no idea that the video was about beforehand. In a figure painting with Julie Green, I became obsessed with pink and blue and a limited color palette in general, which led me to a series I started last year called Cotton Candy. Cotton Candy focused on childhood memories and nostalgia after my grandpa passed away in 2019. Around the time of the funeral, we spent a lot of time digging through boxes of photos. So I was referencing those and primarily working with pink and blue watercolor with a lot of salt washes in the background. It was really cathartic to paint these. And then when quarantine started last spring, I began a quarantine journal with a nine by 12 multimedia journal and a gouache set. I'm not sure how much I necessarily want to remember of this time period, but I treated it like a visual diary. These pages were referencing a recurring nightmare I had when I was 18 and I've always had trouble with sleep. I grew up with sleep paralysis and this was when I wasn't sleeping hardly at all. So when I did my nightmares and hallucinations were more vivid, which came back during the pandemic. And spending a lot of time alone led me to paint a lot more of self-portraits that turned into a series I titled Talking to the Mirror. Because I do talk to the mirror pretty often, if I'm being honest. I thought maybe quarantine could be a time I really get to be with myself. I've been surrounded by people so much in my academic career. It's hard to connect with others when we are out of touch with ourselves. And this pandemic has made it really difficult for both. But I've also learned so much about our collective and my own adaptability. I've never painted meticulously or realistic, but my paintings have evolved to be looser and looser. Got it. Got it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Grandma. <laughs> um, 
Um, so this felt the most evident with the self-portraits and some of them are just pure play and sometimes even some frustration with experimenting with new ways to paint. I was never trained to paint with a palette knife. I was forcing myself to have less control and paint instinctually. And I admitted earlier how I talked to the mirror. This piece is titled Dancing the Fleet with Mac. I had the house to myself one day and I got all of my art stuff out of my room and bathroom to have more space to paint. And there's a big mirror in the hallway that I used. So this piece was a lot of fun. It's one of my favorites of the series. The self-portraits and quarantine journal I displayed in a group show, Eyes on Fire with Lennox and Schwo at Truck and Broad Gallery last October. And there's another shot of that with the quarantine journal. And I'll just play part of this clip. Hosting uh, the Lost Artist show. And uh, my friend kind of visits me and uh, we met the gallery owner. And then say like uh, we can have like a one week gap between two artists, so we set up this one week pop up show. So um, she was like, "Well, how about I push back the next artist a week? The three of you can have your own show here, and also have a performance aspect." So that was how that kind of live performance came about, which is really exciting, and a really cool experience. We were on the ground, like literally right here for like an hour or two, just trying to come up with different names. We were trying so hard to be serious and so many joke names came out and we were like, but what if, what if this, what if that? And Eyes on Fire was one of the ones that really kind of just stuck out. A lot of these are derived from like staring at yourself in the mirror for hours and hours and hours. And these are like, these are assignments, you know? So these are things that we have to do for class. And it's just something that feels unavoidable. Um, and then furthermore, within the context of being a student, um, everything is through Zoom now. Everything is remote and online. And if you don't have a pair of blue light glasses, your eyes are gonna hate you by the end of the day. And they're gonna be on fire from staring at screens. And, mm. and that video was created by Nicholas Svoboda. These were the live paintings from the show of Lennox and Schwo. I had bought some neon acrylic gouache to use with the palette knife, and these are actually the paintings that started the Chroma Contagion series about the colors and energies surrounding the physical presence of others. This exhibition was the first time I really got out of the house around people I hadn't seen in months. And this is also a painting of Schwo, painted at Chip Ross on a super foggy Friday. This is my mom working from home on the couch. And this is my brother when I interrupted his video games, asking him to model for me. <laughs> Simultaneously with that series, I started painting loved ones from memory without a reference photo, seeing how well I could capture what I remember of them. There's a lot of intention behind the colors. They relate to memories, temperaments, etc. Something that came out of this practice is how much more I trust myself with my memory and instinct and trust the paint, although there are some that didn't make it in the show. One of my favorite quotes of Shelley Jordan's, you have to make bad art to make good art, but I didn't include pictures of those in this. <laughs> this painting was a continuation of Chroma Contagion, but the palette knife wasn't feeling right to work with anymore. I wanted something softer and more fluid, so I worked with watercolor on a larger scale. Part of my practice was closing my eyes after starting staring at my subject for 30 seconds and the colors that I saw I used to paint. From there, Schwo suggested painting the background in front of him. And I started to think of Tia Factor's work on private places and the idea of there being something better, somewhere better to be. Relating back to dissociation, especially in conversation. So that is what these next three pieces are about. Dreamscape and happy place. I thought about deciding between which series to include, but ultimately wanted to fill the walls more and make the space colorful and feel less alone in there. What ties the work together is this year that they were created in, along with my relationship to myself and others. I thought about solitude a lot while I was isolated from most people, but I haven't felt authentically alone. I'm constantly in communication with others via Zoom, text, etc. So there's this deep disconnect I feel from both my friends and myself. So I thought to add pseudo to the title. I Googled the term to see if I had made it up, but turns out I didn't. 
I found an article, I'm going to read part of it because I couldn't articulate this concept better myself, and maybe that's why I'm a painter, but from an assessment of Dr. Averill and Dr. Sundararajan, most fundamentally, solitude is more a matter of the mind than of physical or social locale. Authentic solitude is also profoundly relational. The non-relational features triggered by the biological reaction to social isolation, when they predominate, constitute what we call pseudo-solitude. A capacity for authentic solitude entails emotional and cognitive skills that can be acquired through training. With such skills, solitude can even be experienced vicariously, for example, through art and poetry. In turn, solitude contributes to the advancement of genuine culture, as opposed to the mere adherence to social conventions. To the extent that the capacity for absence is essential for the expansion of ontological parity, an enabling condition would be solitude, in which reduced external stimuli can make it easier to escape the capture of the physically present cues of conventional categories. This is consistent with Avril and Sudvergen's theory of authentic solitude, which is associated with perceived closeness with others as well as with oneself. So I started to think of my paintings as my attempt to achieve solitude vicariously because the circumstances of this year have limited my capacities to do so in any more of a genuine or authentic way. I also emailed Dr. Sundararajan, who gave me permission to use Pseudo Solitude as my title and sent me more resources on the subject. So here are a few more shots from the exhibition, including work from Clouded Vision, Chroma Contagion, and Talking to the Mirror. I want to highlight also a couple of projects outside of OSU. Art for Bale is a project with Bella Contino and Shanti Basu. Yeah. And with the help of many artists from around the world, we were able to donate $1,000 to the Bale Project last summer. The Bale Project is a nonprofit that provides free bail assistance to dismantle the unjust bail system. Our website is currently under construction. We are hoping to keep the project alive with more resources and localize the project to benefit artists in the Pacific Northwest. Painting with Parkinson's is a nonprofit Manju Bangalore started this year to hold free virtual painting classes for those with PD, including her father. Classes are held for two hours the first Saturday of each month, and we rely on donations and grants to send kits out to folks who sign up. If anyone is interested in getting involved with either of these projects, please reach out to me. And here's my contact information. Thank you so much for listening, and I will open it up to questions now and can reshare my screen and go back to any slides if you have any questions regarding a specific piece or item. All right, wonderful. So um, we can open it up to questions now. If anyone has questions uh, for Lacey, um, please feel free to ask. I'm also, once again, putting the virtual show link um, into the chat um, in case you want to have a look at it. So any, any questions? Yeah, so Lacey, first of all, what a wonderful talk that was so cohesive and informative and so wonderful to see the thread running through your work all the way back from high school to uh, now and um, how you've explored so many different media materials directions but maintained the core of your interests in a wonderful way. I had the privilege of seeing the show today in the West Gallery. And when I walked in there, it was kind of, it felt like walking into your family, into your world. That was such a wonderful sense of community, all these people that you painted. And uh, I just think it's such a terrific way to have navigated the pandemic by painting all these people you care about and, you know, sort of creating this almost virtual community. But my question is, um, so as we navigate ourselves out of this uh, pandemic and you, you do encounter more people again, hopefully in person, how, um, how do you see your focus changing? Will it stay the same? Um, that's my question. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I think I definitely like working figuratively has has come from since before this time, of course, but in the future, I'm, I'm seeing myself changing the style in which I'm painting. I think the paintings were so full and full of energy. And now that I'm, I mean, I'm already starting to be around people more than I was. And so because I'm surrounded by this energy, my paintings have a little bit more air and a little bit more light in them. Um, and so I've noticed that there's more breath. And I think that's where the direction is going to go from here. Um,
Also, I, I know that you're um, exploring more mixed media now. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how that factors into your vision and direction and what you're doing? Yeah, um, so I'm actually taking a class with Professor Boonstra in installation. And coming up, we are having an installation show at Trek and Broad Gallery, actually, Lennox Schwo and I. And so we decided to work installation base and kind of expand on our painting skills since we're all painters. Um, so I'm actually creating this piece here. I'm in the studio just because there was Wi-Fi issues earlier. But um, I'm creating a piece with fabric and using embroidery. And I'm thinking of it as painting with fabric. I think that all art really ties together a lot. And that's something we learn about in art history. Um, so I'm just using the same vision, but with different materials. Thank you. And thank you for the comments in the chat. Feel free to ask questions in the chat also. That's totally cool to do and I can read them. I guess one thing that I've thought about, um, I think a lot of artists are thinking about as they move forward, um, as we kind of come out of this strange kind of time is um, how you explain this, how you explain the experience of this um, time to someone, let's say, um, who's, who's turning 20, 10 years from now. Um, or 15 years from now, who, who's maybe too young to remember um, or think about those experiences. How do you think the work that you've made, how do you think they would interact with that, not having had that same experience? Wow, that's, that's a really intense question. I might have to think about it for a second. Um, let's see. All right, I, didn't, I didn't mean to like, <laughs> sorry, but I mean, it's a, it's a question, right? Because yeah. Great question. Be people, of course, that are in this moment now, you know, and, and this is, I mean, I don't know, I'm not gonna ask your age because it's gonna make me feel bad. Um, but, the, you know, there are some of us in this room, of course, that remember September 11th, and that's a flashpoint moment for us. And then there are many in this room that, that don't really, right? And so trying to explain that to someone who wasn't there and their feelings. And so again, in, in 15 years, you are going to start experiencing this as well. You're going to run into people that don't have any connection to this experience. And so how are you, maybe maybe not how do you think they'll interact, but how are you hoping they'll interact with, with your work? I hope that they they get a sense of, of emotion from the, the paintings of the people and they can like get a grasp on their personalities, um, even not knowing them through the, the colors and the mark making. I think the, the pieces that I, feel like are the heaviest um, with feeling are the actually the palette knife pieces. And it's funny because I can't even paint like that anymore. So I know that's a staple of this time um, that it's just like, it's so, it's so much full. <laughs> if that answers your question. Um, Momoko in the chat is asking, how did you find your personal art style? Um, and what was that? What was that process like? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I'm heavily influenced by all of my peers and my professors, and sometimes in ways that I don't notice until it's in retrospect. And I see that I can see influences of Julie Green, of Anna Fiddler, um, Shelley Jordan, Johnny. And I, I've, I've noticed that I paint definitely very loosely. And, and that carries over into other forms of art also, even my prints. I'm not a perfectionist. I, and it's a one shot and it's done. I don't go back into a painting hardly ever. Um, I think that that holds freshness and that's how I enjoy it. It's really about the process more than the outcome. And the painting tells me more than I can ever tell it, so. Thank you. Um, I was curious uh, about your process and um, working with all of these faces, all of these people, you know, when you work, do you work kind of um, in conversation with them? Like, do you keep the, um, the completed portraits up while you're working on new portraits? And do you feel like you kind of like carry that energy forward or is each portrait approached in its own way? I, I, each portrait is really approached um, independent to the person that I'm painting. Um, although the style carries over, uh, I really spend a lot of time thinking about 
that person and our memories together and their temperaments and what I think of them in general. And then once I really kind of decided color palette first typically, and then just start putting down features that make me think of them or color watches, especially with the Clouded Vision series and just go from there. And then from there, it's just intuitive making marks and adding color. And it actually, it surprises me how well I feel like I capture the way I think of them. Even if the, the painting's not accurate to what they look like, it's accurate to what they feel like for me. Brilliant, thank you. I have another question since you're doing portraiture and since I also do portraiture. Uh, I have to be with my sitter while I work. I'm wondering, so I have a two part question. Um, the first part is, do you remain with your sitter for the entire time that you paint? So when the sitter leaves, is the painting over? And two, if it's not, then how do you think the process changes once you are just uh, painting from a memory of that person instead of from, I mean, obviously, you know, the paintings are not meant to be, you know, hyper-realistic in any capacity, but um, still once that person, once that, that energy has left the space, you know, if that's the case, how do you, um, how do you think that process changes? So if I'm painting somebody in person, I, I definitely complete the painting while they're there with me physically. And if I'm painting from memory for the Cloud of Vision series, for example, that is, it is a lot different. I, I think it's different in that it's, it's not, it's less focused on their details and their, their characteristics physically. And it's definitely much more about just instinctually placing the colors. Um, I think they end up being uh, less minimalist with color, I've noticed. And I think that's because I, I'm continuously thinking of different memories with them and connecting different things. Whereas in the moment with somebody physically, I only have that moment. Any, anything else that anyone would like to, to ask or, or comment on? Yeah, Lacey, so today when I was uh, in the gallery and I had seen the portraits of Lennox and Schwo just digitally, and it was so exciting to see those palette paintings in person because the energy is really palpable. I mean, it, there's, they're so um, active and so um, so present in those paintings. And that really comes through. And I think that when you're with the, with the person in the room, that, that intensity really, really comes through in those paintings. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, well, I think that's gonna finish it up. So if we could all um, just give Lacey uh, a nice hand and thank you uh, very much, Lacey, for sharing your work with us tonight. Um, I'm going to hop off and assign um, the hosting to Lacey. So if you'd like to stay around and chat with her or have any questions that you did not wanna ask as part of the group that you'd like to hear uh, from her, you can um, otherwise. Have a good evening, everybody. And again, the, the show link, um, I will drop it one more time um, in the chat. And um, if you should uh, want to take a look at the virtual show, um, you can, it will be up uh, for about a week or so because uh, we don't have a show right after it. So wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Night. Thank, you. Thank you for joining. I I'll hang out for a bit if anyone has any questions. Have your um, professional practices um, with your volunteering and like uh, art for veil, have they informed your uh, practices for the show you feel? Ooh, that's a good question. I would say the work for the show was felt more personal. Like I think of my personal artistic practice as pretty separate from what I do professionally. Although of course everything filters in together, but uh, this feels more 
it's almost like I think of this work as more of a diary <laughs> um, continuing visually and the the work that I do professionally is more um, yeah it's it's more about the other people I feel like this is like a little bit more about me directly <laughs> Um, but I will say moving forward, some of the things that I've taught in painting classes, both through the craft center and through painting with Parkinson's, um, some of the things that I teach to people are different than what I paint in my personal practice, and but they do influence each other a lot. For example, I actually have the painting with me since I'm in the studio. I've been doing these florals um, for different quick classes because they're pretty simple and really fun and people enjoy them because you can add a lot of color and do your own thing with the marks. And I've just been enjoying them so much doing them for work that I'm starting to think of painting them larger in my own practice. And it's, I think this also really ties in with the Clouded Vision series, working with watercolor and just letting the colors melt together. Thank you, um, excellent show. Thank you so much. Lacey, excellent, excellent everything. I'm gonna stop the recording quick and then I'm gonna hop off. So have a good evening. Um,